this is a very appropriate session for JLF at Boulder. The Himalayas are the tallest and the youngest mountains in the world. Now here my facts may be rocky, but the Rocky Mountains are perhaps even more beautiful than the Himalayas. Stretching as they do, more than 3,000 miles, offering a dramatic wilderness with beautiful lakes, a diversity of wildlife. What better place to invoke the holy Himalayan ranges um, and include some of the, which include some of the highest peaks in our planet. Um, the poet Yeats described in his poem called Mount Meru, my daughter is called Meru from that poem. He described them, the Himalayas, as self-born markers of man's enterprise. We evoke them today from different perspectives. Distinguished panelists have their deep and particular relationships with mountains and with the Himalayas. Broughton Coburn is a visiting assistant professor for Colorado College. He's worked on conservation development and film projects in Nepal and Tibet in India for more than two decades. He's written and edited eight books, including two national bestsellers, and he'll speak of different aspects of his encounters across the Himalayan ranges. Dorje Dolma was born in Nepal. She has a fine arts degree from the University of Colorado, Boulder, teacher, artist, author of Yak Girl, growing up in the remote Dolpo region of Nepal, for sale here. She'll share her memories of her Himalayan childhood with us. The other person with a Himalayan childhood, also from Nepal, is my old friend Sujeev Shakya who is an author, a columnist, a public speaker, coach, consultant, business leader. You know why you needed me to do the introductions. <laughs> Everybody and is, um, yeah, they do a lot of things. He's, <laughs> he's the best-selling author of Unleashing Nepal, which is a ready reckoner on the past, present, future of Nepal's rather rocky economy. From economies of developing countries to the economics of human beings, he moves across different worlds with his passion for the Himalayas being the access. He's also been a Buddhist monk um, f and spent long periods in meditation centers and has um, some deep um, spiritual connections. He's also done an essay in a, one of the books which sadly has not shown up out in our bookstore here. More on that later. <laughs> Hold up the book at this moment, Sujeev. This is a book called The Himalayan Ark, and I have edited it, so. <laughs> um, now we come to Bate Davis, who we are so delighted he's here. He was in Jaipur many years ago. He's a distinguished writer, photographer, and filmmaker, uh, currently a professor of anthropology, and the uh, chair in cultural and eco uh, cultures and ecosystems at risk in the University of British Columbia. He's the author of 22 books, including One River, The Wayfinders, and Into the Silence, which had won the 2012 Samuel Johnson Prize. He's the recipient of the 2009 Gold Medal from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, the 2011 Explorers Medal, the 2012 David Fairchild Medal for Botanical Exploration, the 2017 Roy Chapman uh, Andrews Society's Distinguished Explorer Award, 2017 Christopher Onjache Medal for Exploration, and the 2018 Mango Park Medal from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, and I've cut out quite a few more <laughs> things here. And we are truly, truly honored to have him here. Mm. Uh, holding the conversations together, we have um, Nico Odysseus, who has a background in environmental studies, in politics, and in Buddhism. Um, before moving to Shambhala pu Publications as its president in 2010, he had careers in winemaking, education administration, and enterprise software. Spread over many years, he spent two years, over two years in India, in Nepal, and other parts of the Himalayas. As for me, my hometown is right up there in the mountains, not too far from Nepal in the central Himalayas in a small place called Nenital. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Jaipur Literature Festival and of uh, 
the Bhutan Literature Festival. And the book, The Himalayan Ark, uh, he, uh, there's another book which Shambhala has published, which we are very, very proud of, which is Himalaya, which I have co-edited with uh, Ruskin Brond, my friend. And this book has won the prize for best cover in India. It's, it's really, so if you believe in buying a book by its cover, go write for it. <laughs> and. I hope that um, Suji will read from some of the other books. So this, uh, I, as I said, I want to express my love and devotion to the Himalayan ranges, indeed to mountains everywhere. And I hope this will be the first of many sessions here in Boulder of connectivities with mountain ranges and peoples around the world, and perhaps the Andes next year. Thank you. Thank you, Namita. Great. Well, I think the fact that this is um, in spillover land with, uh, with uh, not enough seats in the, in the room and people are watching us outside just shows how much the Himalayas is, is, I think, unique among anywhere. It's just held in such fascination by everywhere around the world. It's re perceived remoteness, it's height, it's vastness, all of those things coming together. And part of that fascination... Um, shows up in, it, it shows up in, in very different ways. I first started um, reading and learning about the Himalayas through the works of like Peter Hopkirk, uh, Trespassers on the Roof of the World, Foreign Devils on the Silk Road, Heinrich Herr stuff, but also at the same time listening to, uh, reading voices from those regions, whether it was the Dalai Lama or so much of the kind of Buddhist stuff that um, Shambhala Publications publishes. And it's just so interesting the the varying views um, of of this of this range, whether it's you know how people perceive it or how states perceive it as a storehouse of treasures, as a as a place to conquer. That Wade, you talk a lot about in your in your um, recent book on Mallory and everybody, um, and the the beauty that you capture brought and um, the changing perceptions and, and realities of the people in the place that, that Sajeev will talk about. And then just what it means to have uh, the, the Himalayas as a home. And I think we can start with that a little bit first. But, but before I do it, I want to read one quote from um, a book called Mountains of the Mind by Robert McFarland, who's um, a wonderful author, British author, less well known here, but uh, fascinating. Um, and this is his book on mountain climbing generally, which he talks, um, he talks, the Himalayas obviously feature in it, but it's a, it's a little bit broader. But he says, when we look at a landscape, we do not see what is there, but largely what we think is there. We attribute qualities to a landscape which it does not intrinsically possess, savageness, for example, or bleakness, and we value it accordingly. We read landscapes, in other words, we interpret their forms in the light of our own experience and memory and that of our shared cultural memory. Although people have traditionally gone into wild places in some way that, to escape culture or convention, they have in fact perceived that wilderness, as just about everything is perceived, through a filter of associations. William Blake put his finger on this truth. A tree, he wrote, which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. The same historically holds for mountains. And I think that very much holds for the Himalayan region in particular. So to start off, I think it would be great to hear from you, Dorje, a little bit about what the Himalayas mean to you, like having grown up there and spent the first 10 years of your life. Um, because for most of us, it's, it's a place far away. And for you, that's not the case. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being part of this beautiful uh, festival. Um, my other home is Boulder. I lived here for 24 years, and I do have a home, but this is Boulder Public Library is my other home, and I wrote my book here, like most of my book here. If I write another book, I might have to pay rent. Um, but f so, yeah, the mountain for... So I grew up in... a. a place in Nepal called Dopo, which is at, located at third, in the uh, northwestern part of Nepal. And um, 
there, it's where my villagers, they're it, located at 13,000 feet, and there are no roads, no electricity, no running water. No, uh, when I was there, no school or hospitals. So the, I'm, basically everything around me was just mountains, and it's above tree level. And for us, in, in, uh, our culture was very uh, connected to nature and animals. And they're not just mountains, they're actually mountains that have voices. And for us, it, it was a very, um, there were times I felt like I was being watched because we have a lot of spirit, like spirit mountain, that uh, we have uh, spirit rivers. And um, I remember uh, there's one time that I had to collect, I collected sticks from the river and that had a lot of sticks. And, but then when, came, when I came home, my grandmother told me, no, those belong to the river. So I had to give it back to the river. And I was like, you know, it would be nice if we can share. Um, <laughs> but I'll see it. Because I've, you know, I, uh, I was a herder. I spent uh, taking care of animals in the mountains uh, at sometimes at, you know, 18,000 feet. And I, one of my jobs is I had to collect sticks. And so, so for us, the mountains we had, were meant a lot of things. We have holy mountains. One of our most holiest mountains is called Shea Crystal Mountain. A lot of tourists and pilgrims go there. And there are protectors, and um, they, they are our Google map, really. <laughs> they, guide, they guide us. So for us, um, mountains and just the general um, nature was as, as important as our daily life. Things. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. <answer. laughs> and, I, and I remember when we had lunch, you talked about, um, we were talking about the snow leopard, Peter Matheson's snow leopard, and you said, I don't know why they were spending so much time looking for them. They should have just come help fend them off from my yaks, <laughs> the, the, which is, she was doing as a 10 year old girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was, um, I started working at age five. Uh, I was a herder, and I didn't get any holidays or um, n no pay, uh, but I had to work every day, even during blizzard storms, and, um, and I had to take the mount, uh, animals, uh, goats, sheep, yaks, horses, uh, to, uh, you know, mountains uh, way up in, the, uh, you know, 13, 18,000 feet. And my main job was to make sure the wolves and the snow leopards didn't um, eat one of mine. And... <laughs> Uh, that was hard at age seven, uh, <laughs> uh, and there is like, for example, there was one time I had a couple encounters with snow leopards, but there's one particular one. I had uh, almost like a 200-pound snow leopard, and that killed, uh, you know, three of my goats, and then ran off with another one, and I had to run after the snow leopard to get the dead goat back. And um, with with the snow leopard, they're I think they're really unique animals to look at, but not when they're taking one of my goats. <laughs> and so it, that that for us for us they're just part of part of our life, and they were there. And people have asked me like, how do you scare snow leopard? Like, do you have a gun? And I'm like, what am I going to do with the gun? I'm more likely to hurt myself because I wouldn't know how to use it. But also, we um, never felt, we, you know, I got frustrated, but I never felt that anger. You know, I wanted to kill you, kind of. I never felt that anger because we all had, we all had needs. We all have to eat. And for, for me, I did get frustrated with them because, like, you know, that, that one time when it killed four goats, and I was like, look, Next time, just take what you can eat, because now I got a whole bunch of dead goats that I have to drag down the mountains, and uh, I'm going to get in trouble when I get home. So, you know, that was sort of my, you know, connection with Snow Leopard. But yeah, when I saw that book about the Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson, and when I asked, like, what is this book about? And somebody said, oh, this man went looking for a snow leopard. And I said, what well, did you, did they find it? And they said, no, 
He should have looked for me. <laughs> I would have kept... Well, I think, um, I don't know if it was you, but someone, there, there's an upcoming shot here in a second where a snow leopard is not bothering yaks anymore. I don't know, is that from your, your, your book, Rod? <laughs> where was that shot taken? Um, actually, in a monastery, uh, as kind of an update to um, uh, Dorje's uh, really remarkable account of life in uh, Dopo, in terms of conservation that's going on uh, in uh, Nepal, at least with snow leopard, uh, it's true that uh, if villagers, herders, could catch a snow leopard or snare it or entrap it, then they would parade the carcass around uh, villages and ask for handouts, and villagers would throw money at them, essentially, for ridding the village of, uh, of a pest. Uh, now, in some valleys, for instance, in the Everest area, Annapurna area, and so on, uh, with um, environmental education um, and growing awareness, uh, the snow leopards are being protected at the same time that um, the uh, livestock, uh, sheep and goats, are being protected to a degree. It's an ongoing process. Uh, but uh, Electric fencing has been introduced in a limited way in some areas uh, and uh, other herding techniques and so on. So conservationists are hopeful that uh, uh, the, uh, people can herd and have snow leopard at the yeah. same time. I w I, one thing I want to say is like, I, you know, I never um, really felt they were, I was always grateful that they didn't kill me. That's all I have to say. And I think, I think I'm really happy to know there are people uh, working to protect the snow leopards so they don't go extinct. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that was part of our culture growing up is like, we only killed because, um, if killed a wolf or snow leopard, if they're a little bit, um, they're going, you know, being a little too greedy, just going, sometimes snow leopard, uh, for a particular reason. Uh, there are a couple, they would just you know, kill a whole bunch in one a village and then go to the next village. And that's when village uh, men get together and decide this one's gotta go. But most of the time, we, you know, we all have sort of a respect for all animals. Yeah, such an interesting kind of shifting perspectives. And I think one of the, one of the interesting things when I was reading your book, Wade, was about how the, these sort of post-Victorian explorers had such a, you know, on, on one hand, in, in Tibetan, and I'm not sure if in Dolpo language it's, it's different, but there was no word for like mountaintop. And then in, in your book, the, the sort of unbelievably intense passion to sort of conquer these peaks and that sort of like almost militaristic coming out of World War I, the sort of militaristic conquering um, all those sort of words that went around it. Um, where, do you, where, did the, where does that come from? Well, one of the things I did um, in writing that book, Into the Silence, is I got hold of Zatra Rinpoche, who's the Lama of Rong books, Namtar, his spiritual autobiography. And these aren't strictly autobiographies as we think. It's more like a litany of spiritual deeds through a lifetime. But by translating that, I, monks in Kathmandu do that. Um, and it's fascinating to see how how Trivial, trivial the appearance of the British uh, wrong book was for the, the monks. I mean, it barely warrants a single passage where the Lama says it's unfortunate they risk so much agony for such pointless goals. And of course, you know, if you think about it, it's the same thing with mountaineers today. I mean, we, 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 we consciously go up into a zone of oxygen deprivation so severe that consciousness is obliterated and death is courted. And um, for the Tibetan or Buddhist perspective to, to waste one precious incarnation in such a task is about the, the stupidest thing you could ever do. Uh, and there's also all this hippie ethnography about Everest, like Shomalungma's sacred mountain. It wasn't sacred at all. Um, uh, in fact, that's why they were allowed to climb it. What's fascinating is, is actually the landscape and the environs, which is one of the hidden valleys of Guru Rinpoche, you know, Zatra Rinpoche, I mean, Guru Rinpoche, uh, um, uh, Padmasambhava, when he brought, transmitted the Dharma to Tibet, um, he sowed treasures um, in all these sacred valleys that it became like a ring of bone along the entire mountain chain. And, 
These treasures were both roadmaps that existed in literal space and metaphysical space, and, and these really were the refugia, uh, and wherever um, Guru Rinpoche um, walked became holy ground. So the landscape around Everest is sacrosanct, which is why you know, the, the, uh, so many people um, went there for a retreat. But I remember you, you talking about how like they couldn't go in certain areas because that's where like Milarepa was. Right. Well, just, but like, even like for example, everywhere. you know, you, how many accounts have you heard of the Rongbuk Monastery going back to the dawn of time? Well, it was actually built in 1903, uh, and all those monasteries, Tenboche and Solokumbu, uh, they, they, Brat knows a lot more about, about this than I certainly do, but there wasn't really that strong monastic tradition until the British introduced the potato in 1870. And it was with that new agricultural wealth that that whole region really flourished. And that led to the money that allowed for these monasteries to be built, which potatoes. is- Potatoes. Potatoes, well, you know, and, and so, so there's all, it's a good lesson about how dynamic culture is. And I, yeah, the one point about Everest that is, I think really interesting is that we always have this idea of Tibet as some kind of cosmic meritocracy, you know, floating. And, and these Everest expeditions were absolutely rooted in geopolitical reality. I mean, it was Young Husband's invasion of Tibet in 1903 at the behest of Curzon that only achieved two things, destroying the Tibetan army, awakening the wrath of China. So the Dalai Lama, who flees the British to Mongolia, then 10 years later flees the Chinese into Nepal, where he, or into Darjeeling, where he meets Charles Bell. And then the permission to climb Everest, because you couldn't go through Nepal, that comes about as part of a very complex um, diplomatic initiative of Charles Bell, which was, the goal of which was to modernize the Tibetan army um, to, to, to allow it to stand up against China. And so it was really all part of an arms deal upon which you know, huge amounts of weapons went into Lhasa, and that's how the British got permission to climb Everest. And then on the backside of Everest, it's very interesting, when Mallory dies, and, and the entire expedition in 1924 has been funded by film rights. And that was all because John Noel thought that it was a slam dunk, they're gonna get to the top, and suddenly Mallory dies, and the film becomes not a celebration, but a eulogy and he's in a complete panic. So he gets seven lamas to come from Gyantse to decorate the stage in London for the premiere. And he gets a stage made up to look like a Tibetan monastery. And, and those lamas had no permission from the Dalai Lama. And the film itself caused considerable offense. And that was really critical, because even as Mallory is dying, F.M. Bailey, a spy and frontier officer, is in Lhasa fomenting revolution on behest of the 13th Dalai Lama against the conservative monasteries in the Lhasa Valley, Gandhintim. And, and at that critical moment, because of this film of Everest, um, the, the Dalai Lama has to withdraw his support for the uprising, and the conservative monasteries win. The army is not modernized, the nation is not modernized, which left it a lot weaker to deal with the Chinese in 1949 and, of course, 1959. And, of course, at that point, um, um, uh, the permission to go back to Everest in 25, 26, and 27, which is what the British w wanted to do, was rescinded. And it would be a decade before the British went back to Everest. So all these efforts were always, there was a lot of complex geopolitics going on all the time. Well, I, I think that that's in, the, when, when they went through Charles Bell and Sikkim, they had to circumvent Nepal, which would have been the fastest way. And, and that brings me to sort of the role of Nepal, which has always been the, this sort of in, the, in a very uncomfortable middle in, in many ways. Um, and, and, and Sajiv, you were talking about sort of the, the present Mumbai, Shanghai access. And, and can you just talk about sort of the evolving role of, of Nepal in the region and, and how things are changing? Thank you. Um, I think when we uh, look at Nepal, uh, it's the fact that it never got colonized compared to the other uh, South Asian countries. So it, it has a sense of identity and also has a sense of strong nationalism. And uh, the strong nationalism in terms of identity, despite the fact that Nepal has a variety of um, communities, tribes, and ethnic groups within the country. So that brings in a lot of complications. So for 70 years, there's been different sets of um, 
different sets of political changes. Uh, we've been in long sets of transition. But having said that, um, it, it sits in also a situation where it compares, it has always felt it has been small. So Nepal always thinks it's a small country and it compares itself with Bhutan, 800,000 people, the state of Sikkim, about half a million people, whereas Nepal is a 30 million you know, population country, nearly one and a half times of Australia, about five million less than Canada. So, so, so we, but we, the, our mindset is small. And since all the um, texts that you read as you, uh, you know, sort of uh, study in Nepal is that you are told that you are a small country, you are a yam between two boulders. You know, uh, and that's how the first conqueror of uh, the, the Nepal, Idifai of Nepal, Prithi Narayan Shah, he talks about Nepal being a you know, yam between two boulders. But, and now, but the good thing, that's the evolution is that our neighbors are getting richer. So it's not we are, and when you have two rich neighbors, it's good to have two rich neighbors. And India is growing and China is growing. And when you have two rich neighbors you know, building nice houses, we hope the roads get paved and so Nepal benefits. So it's also the change in mindset. And the second issue with Nepal is that it's always, again, the business of poverty in Nepal has been um, a big one. And whether it is being Nepalis who continuously tell people that we are very poor, we are very poor, so we become aid dependent. And at the same time, there are a lot of projects and a lot of, you know, sort of people have, you know, uh, rent seek on Nepal's poverty. And as we move ahead, you know, you've got India growing and China, given the space, you know, China has a year of the, it's been a year of a jackpot for China as it, you know, becomes the um, crusader of globalization. And in that, Nepal stands in between what I call is the Mumbai-Shanghai axis. And we see some very interesting things evolving, which I can you know, continue talking later. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the whole Belt and Road Initiative and the money they're pouring in, I mean, do you, do you see this as, I mean, roads are, are one thing and in getting infrastructure support, but are there, are there sort of give backs with that? In terms of, I don't know if sovereignty is quite the right word, but. No, I think the Belt Road Initiative is, we haven't seen the invest, Chinese investment so much in, in Nepal as we see working in Africa and working in Southeast Asia, we see a, a, a lot of the Chinese influence and uh, Chinese investment. In Nepal, it's still like the Indian investors, it's more of the mom and pop stores coming in from, you know, mom and pop investors coming from smaller regions of uh, China, like the smaller regions of India, and not the big business people from Beijing or Shanghai we get to see in Africa or Southeast Asia. Similarly, we don't see big investors from Mumbai or Delhi in, uh, in, in, in Nepal. Uh, also, Belt and Road Initiative is not an investment, you know, so it's not an aid vehicle that comes with arms sale or something. It is an investment vehicle. So you must learn how to negotiate with them. And we are learning the reality of this new China emerging and having my father live in Tibet and, you know, leave Tibet during the, at the annexation, for me it has been very difficult to reconcile with the fact that I have to learn about China. You know, I have to now travel to China. And to see, because the way they are, uh, you know, if you look at the, you follow the tweets of the, um, for instance, the Chinese ambassador in India, the way, you know, they they're talking, started talking like American diplomats, you know, the way they talk about, you know, how the way they propagate about uh, their country. At the same time, uh, if you look at the Chinese ambassador, for instance, in Nepal, she speaks Nepali. And if you go to the consular office, it's all Nepali. So there, there is this, apart from the investment, there's this whole, you know, what they call is the cultural assimilation that is taking place. And, but for Nepal, we still having a land link with India and a deep relation, cultural relationship with India, and India and China working together on the trade front, uh, we would not see the Chinese influence that we are seeing in other countries. You know, while the press talks about it, but we, since we are working in that field, we see that you know, India and China are working together on this $100 billion trade deal. The, the Prime Minister of India, uh, India and uh, the Chinese President have met 15 times over the last four years, lots of initiatives taking place. So, so in that sense, uh, what is happening in Africa and what's happening in Southeast Asia, we may not see that sort of Chinese uh, you know, investment. But at the same time, Nepalese are very, very upset with uh, what's happened with India, you know, the blockade of the borders in 2015 after the earthquake, a whole generation will not be able, will not forgive them, so forgive India. So it's a, it's a very interesting reality uh, that we would continue to watch and see how it emerges. Well, it's, 
Interesting to also see, uh, Sujeev, and I'm wondering, um, you know, the press in Nepal is very volatile. Um, there's a lot of uh, politicking back and forth. And uh, we know the history uh, about the Chinese occupation, essentially, of uh, Tibet. And it appears, first in Tibet, they came bearing gifts. And right now, uh, they are the, uh, they're supporting the large hydroelectric projects that are being built in Nepal. And just recently, within the past couple of months, there was an announcement that um, uh, China was planning to extend the railway, which has come all the way to Lhasa and Shigatse. They're planning to extend it to Nepal. And from the southern village of uh, Kirong in Nepal, uh, engineers have looked at it, and they uh, figure that 90% of the route will either be in tunnels or on bridges. I mean, the, the Chinese economic uh, juggernaut uh, is uh, basically something that Nepal is not prepared to deal with, I, I would say. How are they really going to uh, manage or stand up to China and, and India at the same time? Perhaps the Himalayas are a speed bump for China on the way to India and to ports, Indian ports. Um, the, the way I see it is that uh, the railway is not Nepal's necessity. It's basically India and China wanting a connectivity through Nepal. And we need to understand that very clearly, that it is not, you know, China is not building the railway to connect to Nepal. It's, so if you look at how China and India are working together, if you look at the history of the last three, four years, investments, the sort of the trade deals, and the, the investments that are flowing each other, this is what they want. And it is also, there is a lot of rhetoric around this, and we all are aware of how difficult these projects are. But having been working in Africa and the way China operates, it won't be surprising that they would just, you know, sort of, if there is an economic sense, they just push things. And that's something that we are also very uh, scared of. Also with China, I think it is, it is, we all realize that it is all about business and investment. It's nothing to do with, you know, it's, it's no do good, feel good sort of a thing that, for instance, the, the Marshall Plan brought in or you know, the aid that flew in from, say, US or UK or other countries. It's pure business. And when we are looking at pure business, we need to learn how to negotiate. And, uh, and also, we, also in Nepal, the good thing is that the Nepali citizens beyond a certain point of time do, do not take things lying down. You know, this is a country that has, you know, removed, you know, anti-corruption chief, corrupt people. It has, you know, I mean, changed, you know, sort of recently and because of social media. Recently, there was a minister who just spoke against, um, you know, sort of women students in Bangladesh. And uh, within a week, he had to resign. So, so we've got, there's going to be, if things get to, and especially, in the, it's a very a country with a lot of environmental sensitivity within, yeah, lots of activists. And if things go a bit too much, I think there's going to be resistance. But we need to understand very clearly that this is not a China-Nepal deal. It is a China-India deal uh, where Nepal is coming in between. Thanks. Um, I just want to, we only have a few minutes before we do Q&A. So there's one topic that I wanted to explore a little bit, which is just the environmental piece. You know, there's a, in, in uh, a book, uh, Trungpa is born in Tibet, there's this prophecy that's related about this mountain saying, when this mountain turns black, that's when a whole bunch of bad things happen. And, and just as the, the snows are, you know, with global warming and, and it's a, both a bellwether and also just a very sensitive area. And I'm just wondering how, with, with money coming in from China to some extent and with, with other things happening, what's going on there? What, do you, what, what are the priorities? Uh, difficult uh, question, very difficult. Um, the population of Nepal has uh, grown um, astronomically. It's tripled uh, during uh, the time that uh, I, I've lived there, or uh, I first went to that part of the world 44 years ago. The population then was about 10 million, it's 30 million now. The imperative of uh, development um, and uh, people wanting, needing, to consume resources, especially if you consider um, the higher carbon footprint that most of the world uh, likes and uh, perhaps should have some access to. 
is, um, is hitting the Himalayas hard, I might say. Uh, politically, uh, uh, now with uh, the new constitution in Nepal, it's interesting uh, to find uh, there's been uh, a lot of decentralization of political power, which is a good thing. Uh, in uh, one uh, side effect, though, has been that the protected areas of Nepal are coming under fire. Uh, the national parks, the conservation areas, um, I believe that um, 18 or 23 percent of Nepal is under some kind of protected area designation. The people who live uh, in the periphery, on the borders of these areas, uh, want their protected areas back. And they're claiming indigenous rights, uh, and they're claiming that um, we need these areas. They're going to waste uh, without uh, being utilized by humans. Uh, they all have arguments, and in the political fray, that we have in that part of Nepal, India and Nepal is a very political region. Um, it's, it's difficult to uh, uh, determine how all of this is going to play out. But just quickly, just, I think when we look at these environmental issues, we have to ensure that we don't talk about country specific because then I mean, the Himalayas don't have borders, you know, rivers don't have borders, you know, when bird flies or the smoke comes in. So we have to have a more of a concerted, you know, sort of outlook. And, and we also learn, need, to, need to learn from the region. Like, for instance, Bhutan has about 70% forest cover and they've been able to preserve things well. Like, for instance, if you look at the Indian state of Sikkim, they've been promoting organic you know, agriculture and you know, sort of the entire state talks about being organic agriculture. They have got rules on how you're going to manage cars because everybody's owning cars. So how do you, you know, sort of regulate the ownership of cars? So, so there are these lessons within the Himalayas on people who are managing the rivers better, people who are managing industries better. So how do you, how do you take those lessons and not, rather than a country specific perspective, uh, take up a larger regional perspective. And that's what, you know, for the last couple of years we've got this meet that is happening in March every year called the Himalayan Consensus, where people from the region are coming in and ideating and to sharing what they have been doing and what may be useful for the other parts of the region also. Okay. Um, just a, yeah. We'll do Dorje and then we'll go to Q&A. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to give an example of the changes happening. Uh, right now, like people are, for a long time, we, you know, there's no road in Dolpo, but now people are building road, hand built, just like digging against a mountain. And there is also possibility that road might be built through China because we're right on the border of Tibet. And, you know, for me, you know, growing up from a place with, at, at a time when we did, you know, we, it was just us against the mountains. And I do have sort of a mixed feeling about the change because one, uh, I do want the access to go, people to travel so that, you know, we can have uh, health care and a more education resource. But at the same time, I do worry about the, the change in the environment, especially pollution. I mean, right now, Whenever I go to Kathmandu, I feel bad leaving people down there because there's like no blue sky. And right now, uh, um, you know, the mountain region of Nepal is still pretty. We still have blue sky and people can still, you know, breathe fresh air. But I do worry about how, like how can we? Not, I don't think it's not just about the. And we're, we shouldn't look at them. Not thinking not only in the Himalayan region, but just the whole world, because I, every year I'm noticing there's more and more natural disaster. And I think that's when we all need to think about what we're doing, like how much trash are we, like think about all the trash we're putting out in the ocean. Just I think this is something that um, I, to me concerns all of us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions? So now that I'm in a space where we have this panel of experts who know so much about these mountains, and we have an audience that obviously cares very much about these mountains, I want to correct 
your pronunciation of the name of these mountains. Please note, it is really disgraceful that we continue to call the, them the Himalaya. They are the Him Ale. Him means snow, Ale means home. So if you take nothing back from this session, remember what I am telling you and pronounce this name correctly for the rest of your life. Uh, just to counter, if you look in the um, Merriam-Webster dictionary, it gives both pronunciations as correct. Because I sweated it before this panel, like, knowing that there were a variety of ways of doing that. <laughs> a strong voice has spoken. Right. Have we got another question? Really? Really? Yes, yes, yes. I simply want to counter what this is. <laughs> uh, that's Simon Winchester who wrote the book on the Oxford English Dictionary. I, if, you follow, if you follow this argument, you would call Paris Paris, you would call Rome Roma. The English language, which we in this room nearly everyone speaks as a first language, happens to call Paris Paris and Rome Rome. We call the Himalayas the Himalayas. I'm sorry it offends your ear. <laughs> nonetheless, we have some right on our side. We have <laughs> but the French were not colonized by the British. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna let that that conversation simmer, and we'll take that one outside afterwards. Thank you both. Other questions with the microphone in the middle, right here. Hi. Oh, oh I back there first. Sorry. I don't Vanessa? Know if you can see me. Hi. Um, I'm only asking a question because Simon made me do it. <laughs> um, no, but I really love this panel. Um, and I had one thought and one question. Um, my first thought is slightly romantic. I hope you don't disparage me too much. But I do want to say that something that struck me when I was in Nepal this summer was uh, I was so incredibly impressed by the positivity and the excitement with the new government and with all that is happening in Nepal right now after a civil war, after an earthquake after a blockade, all of the things that Nepal has gone through, being a yam in between two boulders, and continually rising up and meeting its challenges and finding solutions to its problems and creating a constitution and building a government. I just, I, I'm so impressed by the endurance, I realize I'm being incredibly romantic, but I, I just think it's worth noting that this country has gone through so many steps in recent history and is meeting its contemporary challenges head on. So I think that that's worth noting. <laughs> and I did wonder what Sujeev would have to say about that. But I did have a question, and it's connected to so much of what you've been saying, is um, I was in the Muktinath area, where I haven't been in 25 years, and I found roads being chipped into the mountains, hands done, some robes are already finished. Kagbeni already has full electricity, telephones, f like stoves and fridges and things that I never thought I'd see, or I certainly didn't see 25 years ago. And on the one hand, I found it very exciting for the community and it created a connectivity. On the other hand, I did have questions about the future and sustainability if this happens all over the Himalayas. And so I would like to hear a bit more of your thoughts on uh, this issue. Um, no, thank you for you know the observations because I think um, because if you look at uh, the Nepali society itself as a very negative society, we we don't talk about positives. We always talk about problems, you know. So there's so many things that the positive that's happened, and that's what one of the things I've been continuously trying to do is to document positive stories and try to you know look at the future on what had happened. So at many times I've been introduced as easy introduction of mine has been Nepal CEO, chief eternal optimist. And I continue to do that. And uh, we've seen a lot of change. Uh, like um, to, about a month ago, I was talking to a general in the army and I was asking him that does he recognize the, pe the, the you know, sort of uh, the people from the, you know, sort of erstwhile Maoist army who has been integrated to the national army. 
And do you recognize them? Can you distinguish them? And he says, no. And it's completely contrast to what we see in Africa working there, where for 30, 40 years, there are still these groups that have not been integrated. So there are a lot of good stories. But at the same time, I think for your question is that the, the discourse on development has always been about roads, about access, you know. And it's not about also looking at how can you do all that through conserving. And then coming to Boulder is a fascinating you know, experience. And it's good that Boulder and Kathmandu are now sister cities and we can take a lot of lessons from here. Because with the local governments coming in, we have 753 of them some last year. So what I call is the bulldozer terrorism has started. Every local government buys a bulldozer, you know, and then they just bulldoze and they build roads. And it's, these roads start from nowhere, end nowhere. During the monsoons, you know, we have landslides. And how do we, you know, and this is a big challenge for the development partners who are funding them, you know, who are also helping this to happen, to say that how do we start a discourse to say that, okay, how do we restrict this? And how do you, okay, people need electricity, people need access to healthcare. There are basic social service, you know, uh, needs. You know, you shouldn't be walking three days to go to a school or sit for an exam. Uh, so you need access of two hours, within two hours walking distance schools. But for that, you don't have to be destroying, uh, you know, the, 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 and the lovely landscape and the flora, fauna. So how do you balance it? And this continues to be a big challenge. And uh, there is also, among the young people, there is more realization. And I think hopefully this generation would, you know, sort of the uh, millennials will push into more uh, realization and push the government to become you know, aware of conservations as we move through development. I don't know whether it answers a question with my perspective. Thanks. I there was think a we question. have time for one very speedy one. Is it a speedy question? There was somebody back there, but now someone else has their hand up in front. I was interested in the theme of uh, continuity and diversity among the different cultures, and in particular, how you see, since it's the one place, that, one of the places of it, Ladakh, in India, how that fits into the larger culture. Do you see that as very much a part of Himalayan culture, or very different because of certain features of it? We've got great candidates to answer this, but Wade, we haven't heard from you in a while. Oh, bro no, we should brush and answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> he really knows Ladakh well. Uh, uh, Ladakh is a uh, Tibetanoid uh, uh, ethnic uh, culture. La ethnic Ladakhis speak a dialect of uh, Tibetan. Um, across the Himalayas, um, essentially segmented by individual valleys, uh, most of the high valley people, for instance, uh, Dorje uh, in Dolpo, uh, they speak a uh, a distinct uh, dialect of uh, Tibetan. And uh, so the Ladakhis, in essence, are a continuation of that uh, Tibetan uh, dialect speaking uh, ethnic group that tags back historically uh, to uh, Tibet. Uh, we tend to lump them together under the rubric of uh, Tibetan uh, culture. And indeed, uh, many of them uh, still respect the Dalai Lama and they respect their uh, lamas who come from various uh, lineages through the very complicated uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, uh, pantheon of uh, lineage lamas and in some cases uh, birth uh, uh, lamas. Um, what's interesting, uh, just to jump from there uh, to Queens, New York, I was speaking with an anthropologist uh, uh, from Dartmouth um, who uh, has identified, and I've heard it uh, spoken, and maybe uh, you've heard it too, um, a new dialect. Um, it's a Queens, New York uh, dialect of, <laughs> I'm not making this up, uh, of uh, Tibetan. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, nominally called uh, Ramaluk. Uh, and it's a, uh, I guess you would call it a pidgin uh, type of language, but uh, because of the great uh, ethnic diversity of all of these uh, Himalayan ethnic groups that have converged primarily in Queens, but at least in the greater New York area, and for that matter, even in Boulder and around the U.S., uh, they have needed a language, uh, a lingua franca, that they can speak together that's not English, uh, but they draw upon English, uh, Nepali, Hindi, 
uh, and uh, largely uh, Tibetan. And so that dialect is uh, developing kind of an interesting new <laughs> development. I don't know that, uh, I didn't know about that. I'm, I didn't, I'm learning English still. <laughs> um, I'm gonna focus on that. But also now that, um, because I came here when I was 10 and then I, you know, I learned English and I forgot my language. So now I'm learning, um, you know, I can do basic uh, conversation. Uh, I mostly it's like a mix of Tibetan and it's dopo, but it's a, there's a combination of both. But I do with my friends, it's like Nepali, English, dopo dialogue, Tibetan dialogue, whatever ways to communicate uh, works. <laughs> Great. Well, I, we're getting the hook now. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining this really interesting panel. Uh, our authors here will be at the book signing area, um, which is right over here, just sort of down the ramp. Um, uh, they have a bunch of their books, and you can go and get one signed, including Namitez over there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>